have everybody here. Good to have you. Amen. We're going to launch out into the deep today. And uh, Lord willing, try to cover some ground that's going to be very, very pertinent, useful, helpful. Father, I ask for the gift of teaching now, Lord. I pray for the presence of the Holy Spirit. God, I need Thee. And Father, I pray for the folks today who hear it. May they receive it. May they have hearts, our Heavenly Father, that are open and receptive with a desire for the truth. In Thy name we pray. Amen. All right. Now, last week I finished with uh, <clears throat> talking about <clears throat> the canon of Scripture and the... Uh, assault on the Apostle Paul's credentials. And uh, you, you'd be surprised at how widespread that is. Uh, and a lot of people, for a lot of different reasons, assault him. But if you have your Bible, turn to the book of Acts chapter number 28, the last chapter in Acts. Acts chapter 28. Acts chapter 28. Now what we have to do here is put, is put three things together. The uh, chronology of the New Testament, the dispensational aspect of the New Testament, and the canon of Scripture. In other words, the uh, Scripture that is inspired. Inspired. If it's Scripture, it's inspired, period. It's a kind of redundant thing to say, but... That's the Scripture. The Scripture is the Scripture. Uh, by studying the New Testament, especially the book of uh, Acts and Luke, you get dates. Luke was a historian. He mentions two Caesars in his, uh, in his writings. He wrote the Gospel of Luke, and he also wrote the book of Acts. In Acts chapter number 25, he, he talks about Caesar, and he calls him Augustus. But this is not Augustus that was Octavian. This is Augustus that was Nero. Once Octavian became the uh, Caesar, Julius Caesar's adopted son, once he became Caesar, uh, they bestowed upon him the title of Augustus, or Great One, or Magnified One, or Magnanimous One. <clears throat> and uh, from then on, he lived till 14 AD, and after he died, all of the Caesars that followed him uh, retained that title, Augustus. So you have to be certain who you're talking about. But Luke mentions Tiberius Caesar, and he mentions Augustus. These are two, two different Caesars. Uh, Augustus, of course, was the one who was in power when Christ was born, and Tiberius was the Caesar when uh, the apostle, uh, when the Lord Jesus and John the Baptist began their ministry. Uh, and Luke, uh, in the book of Acts, in chapter number 25, he mentions another Caesar, and that is Nero. So Luke pinpoints three Caesars for us, Nero, Augustus, and Tiberius. Uh, if you've ever been to the Sea of Galilee, there is a town on the southern tip of southern side of it that's called Tiberius. And uh, it not, was not unusual at all in those days, just like it is today. We name roads and bridges and so forth after important people. That's the way they did then. They named towns after people like that. For example, Caesarea Maritima, where the Apostle Paul was held captive before he was taken to uh, uh, before he was taken to Rome. He was a Roman citizen, and he appealed to Rome. He appealed to Caesar, and the Caesar that he appealed to in Acts 25 is Nero. But Caesarea is Caesar; it was named after Caesar. Maritima locates it next to the sea. For the Greek, for the not Greek, but Latin word for sea or ocean is maris. So a maritime uh, is a sailor of the sea. And uh, so uh, we have dates fixed for us. And it's important because how many times have I told you when the book of Acts finished? What, was the, what did I say that the completion of the book of Acts took place somewhere in what decade? 60s, in the 60s A.D. It started in the 30s. It, covers, it spans a period of 30 years, over 30 years. And so it finishes in uh, 65, 66, 68 A.D. The reason we know that it, uh, 
a couple of reasons. One is in Acts 25, we know that that's Nero, and Nero was assassinated, he was murdered. The Senate turned against him and said he was an enemy of the state, and uh, he was assassinated, I think, 66, 67, 68, 69, 80, somewhere along in there, before 70 AD. I think it was about 67, 68 AD. Nero was assassinated. And uh, what happened in 70 AD that's so important? The temple was destroyed by Titus. All right. Titus. And, uh, um, and, we, and to this day, we have the uh, archaeological uh, proof of it. We have the stones that have been uh, plowed up and moved and huge stones. And so the temple was destroyed. The Lord Jesus said it will be destroyed. He said not one stone will be left upon another. He told him exactly what was going to happen. It did uh, verbatim to what he said. So the Apostle Paul shows up. After the twelve, he's not one of the twelve. He's not one of the original. He's not Peter, James, or John, who were the original pillars of the church. Uh, he's not one of them. He is an outsider. And if you'll remember, when uh, he was on the road to Damascus, and, and the Lord appeared to Ananias in a dream or a vision and said to him, uh, He's a chosen vessel to me to bear my name to the Gentiles. What did Ananias say to the Lord in uh, Damascus? He said, I've heard how this man has persecuted the church. He's a persecutor of the church. Are you kidding? I mean, he's, uh, <laughs> you know, this man's the enemy of the church. And he was. And a number of times in the book of Acts, he reiterates that and tells them over and over again that, yes, I was an enemy of the church. They question his credentials in the book of 2 Corinthians, if you'd like to turn over there with me. The book of 2 Corinthians. And... Uh, let me get the reference here. They question the apostles' credentials. 2 Corinthians 13. That'd be easy to remember, wouldn't it? <laughs> 13th chapter of 2 Corinthians. They questioned his credentials. And uh, they, uh, the reason they did this is because, of course, he had, he had enemies that uh, rejected his preaching because his preaching was by revelation. You have to remember that what the Apostle Paul preached, he preached by revelation. He was chosen, handpicked by the Lord Jesus Christ after Israel had rejected the Jewish kingdom the second time. That's very important to remember that. But in 2 Corinthians chapter number 13 and verse number 3, the Apostle said, Since ye seek a proof of Christ speaking in me, which to you word is not weak, but is mighty in you. You see that? They question him. Well, how do we know that Christ is speaking through you? Since when the Lord was here, he preached the gospel of the kingdom. And now here you are preaching the gospel of the grace of God. When he was here, he was the Messiah of Israel, bringing the kingdom to the Jew. Now here you are going out preaching to Gentiles and telling them that they don't even have to keep the Jewish Sabbath, don't have to be circumcised, don't have to keep the law of Moses. Now here you are preaching this. Where do you get the authority to do that? And to this very day, there's a lot of people out there who reject the Apostle Paul's authority. Now here, look at it for a moment. If you do reject his authority, first of all, you've rejected a big majority of the New Testament books. All right? Romans, 1st, 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1st, 2nd Thessalonians, 1st, 2nd Timothy, Titus, Philemon, probably Hebrews. You've rejected all those books, all right? But not only have you rejected the books, but you've rejected the doctrine of the books. Because nowhere in the New Testament is the doctrine of the church, the body of Christ, spelled out like Paul spells it out. And nowhere in the New Testament is the doctrine of the cross developed about what God was doing in Christ, the justification, the atonement, the redemption, the propitiation for sins, and all of these things that the apostle talks about over and over again, nowhere else in the New Testament is that, is that doctrine developed except in the Pauline epistles, you see. And so when you've rejected that, what have you done? Well, you have a motive for it. There's a reason for this. There's always a reason behind everything. What's the reason? The reason is to reestablish a Jewish church. Have you, how many of you have ever heard of the Hebrew Roots Movement? Most have. It's fairly new. 
It's pretty new. Let's wise, let's put it this way. It's new being identified as that. What they believe is not new. There's really nothing new in any of it, but sometimes they resurrect old stuff. But the Hebrew Roots Movement essentially says that we need to go back under the law. We need to, we need to obey the, the, uh, the, uh, the Mosaic Law and the Sabbath keeping and that the message of Christ is not about a Gentile bride like we understand it to be. The message of Christ is about the kingdom, about the kingdom and about building that kingdom here on this earth. And from something like that, you get, you get, the, uh, you get all kinds of offspring, you, you shoot offs from it. Uh, the kind of things that have to do with the latter rain movement and the sons of God movement and things like that. They, and, and for example, one of the basis uh, foundational teachings that they come from is what's called British Israelism. And British Israelism, a lot of people believe that. Let's say people, no question about it, you can believe that and still be born again. But they believe that Great Britain is the seat of the Jewish throne for the latter days, and that the Jew, and that the and that the British monarch uh, is the representative of that, and so therefore Great Britain takes the place of Israel. It's called British Israelism. Now, what happens when you get that? Well, what happens is that it develops. Everything develops. Everything, and even the people who believe this don't necessarily agree with, with each other later on down the road because they begin to develop their own line of theology from it. How many of you have ever heard of skinheads, neo Nazis? Well, that came straight out of British Israelism. That was the foundation for it. It was the foundation for it. The idea that the, uh, that, uh, that the Jewish people, for example, are usurpers and that uh, the uh, Great Britain is the seat of the, uh, of the authority of the, of the uh, Jewish uh, kingdom. And so it goes. Now, I don't want to get off way off into that, but I'm going to show you what's going on today and why the authority of this New Testament canon is, be, is being attacked and how you can understand why you are what you are. Now, what defines the church? What is the church? What is the body of Christ? What's it made up of? Born-again born believers. Now, does it say born-again Jews or born-again Gentiles or born-again Africans or born-again Englishmen or born-again Portuguese or born-again believers? In the book of Ephesians, chapter number 4, the Apostle Paul stresses the point that there's one body, one church, one faith, one Lord, one baptism, all right? One body. I heard a, I heard a man mention that uh, some uh, university's done a study and that there are 41,000 different Christian denominations. That's mind-boggling. 41,000. So the Baptist writers thought they were the only one, amen? <laughs> true. 41,000. That's a lot. You can understand folks seeing things differently, interpreting in, interpretation of scripture in different ways and so forth. But 41,000? But in any event, the Bible says that he would make of twain one new man. The twain that he's talking about is the Jew and the Gentile become one man. Uh, in plain words, the church of God does not, does not have, does not recognize Jewish Christians and Gentile Christians. For the Bible says that in Christ they are neither Jew nor Greek, bond nor free. They are born again believers. Their identity is no longer an earthly identity of Jew or Gentile. Now they are sons of God bearing the identity of the resurrected Christ. That's what we are. Any time that you interject into the church any kind of a man-made, contrived identity, you divide the church of God. And it is contrived. Make no mistake about that. It's something they fabricated out of the thin air. Uh, the church is one body, all right? Now, I know that there are churches, the Roman Catholic Church teaches that there is no salvation outside their church. There are others who teach similar to the same thing. And when, they, when you start teaching that, what have you done? What would you think if I told you that unless you are a Baptist and subscribe to what we teach, you can't be saved? All right, that's exactly what the Judaizers said when they had the first council in Acts 15. Yes, sir. Absolutely.
Sure. Um, what, if you go back and look at church history, you find divisions of divisions that had divided before they divided. Somebody had a division before they divided that division. <laughs> That's what you get. <laughs> That's the truth. I mean, I've got some. I've got a number of books called The Trail of Blood, this and that, who purport to trace their particular group all the way back to Christ. In other words, this is exactly the church that Christ built, and it's this one. And I'm sorry, you can't do that. I don't. I don't. I don't make a good uh, Baptist, according to some of them, like that. I believe there have been believers for two thousand years that have believed what we believe. Amen. Yes. But I'm going to ask you a simple question this morning. Just ask yourself a simple question. Do you believe that everybody in this congregation right now here at Temple Baptist Church believe? They believe everything exactly the same. No. No. So where is that church you're talking about? I'd like to find that church that's existed somewhere in the past where when you walk through the door, every head, every mind, every faith was exactly verbatim the same and it was put down on paper. This is what we believe. This is the true church. It doesn't exist. That's right. That's why they had councils and synods and all that. Sure. The, the, the apostles' uh, uh, confession of faith. Yes, sir. Exactly. Like I say, there's an agenda. There's always an agenda. All right. So now, so then of course it begs the question, then, well, then what, what, what constitutes a New Testament church? What do you have to believe? And see, this is why they had the Council of Nicaea. The, first re the, re the main reason that Constantine called the Council of Nicaea in 325 A.D. was to, was to put down in writing, I think he called together 300 or I forget how many bishops together and said, this is what we're going to believe and put it down. And, but the big controversy at Nicaea was this. This is a big one too. This is very big. So what was it? It was the Arian controversy. What was that? Arius taught that Christ was a created being. He had a beginning. He had a beginning. Now, you see, the Jehovah's Witnesses aren't original with anything, are they? Joseph, Taz Russell, the Russellites, that's what they called them first before they became Jehovah's Witnesses. They teach that. Was he created? Well, it's the issue of begotten. Beget, this day have I begotten thee. It's the issue of the God-man. It's the issue of incarnation. And, of course, Constantine, uh, to their credit, the Council of Nicaea put it down, as far as you, best you can in writing, that Jesus Christ is eternal. Eternal. He's eternal. And then followed the council and council and council and synods and council and synods and council and all of that. All right. So, you know, and they had councils to determine what were canonical books. And we're going to get into that in just a moment. I'm going to show you what lead, what's, 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 being, what's springing from this, what's happening with this, the issue, the issue of uh, canonical books. So, what, once again, what does it mean to be canonical? A canon, a canon of Scripture. What does that mean? Words mean straight. So, what does it what does it mean? What does it what does is it relates to the scripture? What does it mean, canon of scripture? Pardon? They agree. Certain there's there's. It's recognized as inspired scripture. All right. The apostle Peter mentioned scripture twice in his epistle, and one time he mentioned scripture. He refers to the apostle Paul as writing scripture. That's important. That's important because here's Peter, James, and John. Here's one of the three who said Paul's writings are Scripture. See? And it's very important to understand that. I wasn't there when it was written. Peter was. And Peter knew Paul. They had they had, had a number of encounters with each other. Not necessarily encounters. They had one encounter, but they had known each other and been with each other a number of times. They had one encounter. The Apostle Paul encountered him over the issue of Judaizers. So, Scripture... Scripture, the canon of Scripture, as we have it in our hands today, you have in your hands 66 books, 39 Old Testament, 27 New Testament books. All right. The Jews don't have as many books in the Old as you do, but the only reason for that is because they include others in a grouping like we don't. Okay? That's the only reason. But the Jewish Old Testament is your Old Testament. 
Okay? That's settled. The New Testament is where the dogfight starts. And as I'm trying to point out to you this morning, the dogfight is over the Apostle Paul and his authority to write Scripture. So canon of Scripture means the 66 books of Holy Scripture, 27 New Testament books. The canon of Scripture was closed. It was completed in 95, 96, 97 A.D., 91, 92, somewhere in the 90s, ADs, A.D., when the Apostle John finished Revelation. It was completed. The canon was completed. What's that mean? That means that anything written after that is not Scripture. It may quote the Scripture, and it may be written by good men, but it's still not the Scripture. Why is that important? Because all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction, and righteousness that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished to all good works. Thou hast, Timothy, from a child, thou hast known the Holy Scripture, which is able to make thee wise to salvation. The Scripture Timothy knew, of course, was Genesis through Malachi, or in the, in the Hebrew order, Genesis through Second Chronicles. <clears throat> he knew that, that Scripture. All right. Now, what does it lead to, and where are we going with it? All right. The reason I took you to Acts chapter number 28 is to show you the chronology of the New Testament and the dispensational approach to the New Testament, and then show you what's coming out of that. If you'll notice what happens in the last chapter of the book of Acts, it says in verse 28, Be it known therefore to you that the salvation of God is sent to the Gentiles, and they'll hear it. He had just quoted Isaiah 6 previous to that. And what he's saying here, that this is a decree if you please, a council issued forth by an apostle who's saying now, not that Gentiles can't be saved, but he's saying, not that Jews can't be saved, but that the focus now is toward the Gentiles. When did he say that? 60, 68, 67, 68 AD. Under the reign of Nero. When Peter wrote his epistle, he wrote it when Nero, the madman, was the Caesar of Rome. And if you'll remember, I told you that the Senate had him assassinated because, and, and declared Nero to be an enemy of the state. I mean, he was such an, he was insane. And he had one of his own slaves, I think, help him in the assassination. But in any event, uh, Acts chapter number 28 finishes, finishes now the, the approach to the Jew. Now, if you do not believe, if you do not have a dispensational perspective on the New Testament, then You've, I've, I can ask you some questions that you're going to, have, you're going to be hard-pressed to answer. Like I said last week, explain to me why the Lord Jesus said, go not to the way of the Gentiles or the, lost, or, or, uh, the Samaritans, but go on to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. To the Syrophoenician woman, he said, I'm not come to give the children's food to dogs. All right? How do you explain that? How do you explain this here when the apostle says, I'm going now to the Gentiles? And they'll hear it. How do you explain Romans 11 when God said, I have blinded the Jews until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in? What does that mean? How, how does that relate to the New Testament? If you're preaching a Jewish gospel of a Jewish kingdom and a Jewish Messiah, which are all truths, but they have to be put in their right perspective, in the right dispensation. If you're preaching that today, though, to people, then you have a conflict with the Apostle Paul immediately. And this is why Paul said in the book of Galatia, he said, oh, Galatians, foolish Galatians, who have bewitched you. See, you started in the Spirit, and you started in liberty with the gospel of Christ. He said, if I or anyone else come and preach any other gospel to you than I have preached, let him be anathema, let him be accursed. Then in the book of Galatians, he goes into, the, it goes into Abraham, takes him back to you know, the promise before the law shows how that the faith of Abraham is, God, is how God establishes his gospels regardless of what period of time they belong to and how that that precedes the law and how that God saved before the law. So why do you drag something in now that's already been passed where Christ has fulfilled the law? He deals with all of that. Now I want to talk to you this morning about what one woman, you remember I told you last week she has a website and I'm going to show you where they're headed. Would you like to know where they're headed? Where do you go if you reject Paul? If you reject the gospel of the grace of God, uh, then you've got, you're going somewhere. All right, here's what she says. She says, I believe Yahushua is God in the flesh, 
who came to earth to redeem mankind, crucified the cross, arose three days later, defeating sin and death. I believe the King James Bible purposely mistranslated the name of the Son of God from Yahushua to Jesus. And that this Jesus being taught in the majority of the churches today is not Yahushua himself, but Satan. Now that's a big statement. Okay. Where do we get the word Jesus from? We get it from the Greek word Jesus. All right. You'll find the Latin, you'll find Latin when they, when they say the name, they say it much, they say it closer when I say Latin, I'm talking about Spanish and, and Portuguese. When they say the name Jesus, they say it much closer than we do because they're, they're, the mother tongue is Latin. All right. The name Jesus is an anglicized form of Jesus. All right. Jesus. Iota, Eta, uh, Sigma, Omicron, Upsilon, and Sigma. Jesus. All right. That name, Jesus, is the Greek form of Joshua. All right. The Old Testament Hebrew names, a number of them meant Jehovah saves. They meant Jehovah saves. Yahashua means Jehovah saves. Other names mean Jehovah saves. Jehovah the covenant keeping God. But Joshua is the name because he's the type of the Lord Jesus Christ that is carried over from Hebrew into Greek. That's where they get it. Now here's the thing. Have you ever seen a Hebrew New Testament? <laughs> what? Hebrew New Testament. If you had a Hebrew New Testament in your hand right now, then you know exactly what the Hebrew said the name of Jesus would be 2,000 years ago, right? Think about it for a moment. The New Testament is written in Koine Greek. It's written in Greek, all right? They had three names. They had three, three languages on top of the cross. Hebrew, Greek, and what? Now, when the, he when the New Testament was written, it was written in Greek. Okay? It was written in Greek because the people could read Greek. Most of the people, if you, if, you could if you could read Greek, you could read Greek in Spain. You could read it in, in, uh, in Gaul. You could read it in, in, read it in the Holy Land, anywhere. All right. But the point I'm trying to make is this. The New Testament was not written in Hebrew. If it had been written in Hebrew, if Matthew had, when, he, when Gabriel said, Thou shalt call his name, whatever Matthew had written in Hebrew right there, that would be the Hebrew name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Right? Right, but that didn't happen. Okay? It's written in Greek. You shall call his name what? So what you have to do, since you have a Greek name of a Hebrew, the Lord Jesus was a Jew. You have a Greek name of a Jew. What Old Testament Hebrew name are you going to connect with it? He, this lady comes along and says, Yahashua. Did I say it correct? Yahushua. Well, dear lady, what authority do you have for taking that one name out of all of the other Hebrew names in the Old Testament that mean Jehovah saves and attaching it and making it the one and then saying to me that the name of Jesus is wrong? What does the name Jesus mean in Greek? Jesus, what does that mean? Savior. Soter is the... Is, isn't that Latin? Soter? Savior. He's the Savior. All right. Is he the Savior? Do you think that we poor ignorant Gentiles are messing up when we say the name Jesus? All right. Now, you see what's happening here. She's playing with your mind, but it's a heavy duty thing that she's messing with here. Because what she has done is go back to the Old Testament and pick just like you'd pull out of the thin air a name that's Hebrew, that means Jehovah saves, and say that's the only name you can use. You could just as easily say Joshua. All right, and that's what they did in Acts chapter number, what was it, 7, when Stephen preached. What name did he use, brother? He used Joshua. And he used Joshua in place of Jesus. 
He connected Joshua and Jesus together. Now let's move along because I'm going to run out. Of I got more ground to cover. Here's, here she says, she says, I believe there are 12 apostles appointed by the Lord and not 13. Matthias replaced Judas, not Paul. Now here she attacks him. Okay. She attacks him, says that Paul is not an apostle. Okay. Uh, I remember sitting in class and they argued about the fact that they cast lots to pick Matthias and that that was wrong and that Paul was God's choice to be the 12th disciple. Now, whether or not that's so or not, I don't have an issue with that. That's not an issue with me. The apostle Paul doesn't have to be one of the 12. He said, I was born out of due season. He wasn't with the Messiah. And so, you know, there's not an issue with that. But, pardon? Yes. Yes. Yes, he did. He, the Holy Spirit recognized Matthias in the book. Of, that's what you're saying. Yes, he did. Yes, he did. He, he, he acknowledged the, the, the choice. Yes, he did. I believe the King James Bible is the modern day Garden of Eden containing the tree of life and the tree of knowledge of good and evil through the two different not gospels being preached throughout it. The gospel of the kingdom, tree of life, taught by Yahushua, and I bring to you another gospel, the tree of knowledge of good and evil, taught by the false apostle Paul. One leads to eternal life, while the other leads to apostasy, error, and away from the teachings of Yahushua and his twelve apostles. Now do you see the progression? First you attack his authority. Once you attack his authority, you set up your own identity. She has her own Christ. And now what you do is to build on that. So what she's done is allegorize. She's made an allegory out of it. That the King James Bible, she says, is the modern day Garden of Eden containing both. Now that's a big step to say that that's the Garden of Eden. Now is allegory altogether wrong? No. Look at Galatians chapter number 4. Galatians chapter number 4. <laughs> and verse number 24. But the thing about the Bible is it has its own way of defining itself and explaining itself. Now look at this. Galatians 4.24. Which things are an allegory? For these are the two covenants, the one from the Mount Sinai, which gendereth to bondage, which is Agar. Now Agar is who in the Old Testament? See the little difference in spelling? For this Agar is Mount Sinai in Arabia, and answereth to Jerusalem, which now is, and is in bondage with her children. But Jerusalem, which is above, is free, which is the mother of us all. Now, that's clearly an allegory. Now, what does it mean? An allegory takes something that is real, because Hagar really lived, and then makes a spiritual application of it. That's not altogether wrong because the apostle did that right here. But now here's the thing. The apostle is an inspired writer of scripture. I will accept the authority of Paul when he said that. Without question. Uh, with no question. But I will not accept the authority of this woman telling me that the King James Bible is the Garden of Eden. Now that's important, folks. Because if you do waver on that, then you'll say, well, maybe she's got a hold of something that we need. I want to tell you, I've, I've messed around and said too much on, on a couple of things, and I'm not going to be able to get into what I want to get into with you this morning. I'm going to get as far as I can, though. I'm going to continue with this, uh, with where she's going. Now watch this. I believe the King James Bible contains the inspired Word of God. That's a red flag. Anytime the word contain shows up, watch it. But in itself, as an entirety, see this, is a manipulated manuscript, leaving out the inspired books of, uh-oh, uh-oh, Enoch, Jasher, and Jubilees, and replaced with the RCC, and I'm sure that means Roman Catholic Church, agent provocateur, St. Paul whose books teach and replace, watch this, the gospel of the kingdom with his own gospel of grace. 
which leads readers away from celebrating the feast of the Lord and into adopting pagan rituals and customs. I believe that Paul's ah morality, not immorality, ah, ah means no, his ah morality becoming all things to all people compromise the way and truth of the gospel of Yahushua, which grants adherence a license to sin mentally, leads them into false doctrines such as tongue speaking, the rapture of the church, and negating the celebrating of the feast of the Lord and the Father's commandment of celebrating the Sabbath on the seventh day. All right, I can name two passages in particular, Colossians 2 and Romans 14, where the Apostle Paul says plainly, why turn you again to the weak and beggarly elements? You observe days and feasts and times. Touch not, taste not, handle not. These are all going to perish with the using. And one man esteemeth one day above another. One man esteemeth every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. I can understand that if you want to preach the gospel of the kingdom and you are part of a Hebrew roots movement and you want to take the gospel of grace away, then you're going to assault the writer of those books, and you're going to take it back to the gospel of the kingdom. Did Christ preach the truth when he was here? Amen. Amen. Did he preach the gospel of the kingdom? Amen. Was there anything wrong with what he ever said when he was here on this earth? No, sir. He preached the truth. Could he lie? Absolutely not. But we're not preaching the gospel of the kingdom today. There's a difference. Why are we not preacher? Because of the dispensational progression of the New Testament. The revelation that we have, and I showed you when Apollos in the book of Acts last week, Apollos was preaching what? John the Baptist baptism. Knew only the baptism. Did John the Baptist preach the truth? Yes, sir. Was there anything wrong with John's preaching? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Nothing. The Lord said of them born of women not risen greater than John. The law and the prophets, he said in Luke 16, the law and the prophets were until John. Hold on. But since that time, the kingdom of God is preached and every man presseth into it. Now, Priscilla and Aquila went to John, went to the apostle, uh, went to Apollos. Knowing only the baptism of John, did they rebuke him and jump all over him? What does it say they did? More fully, more further, further. Further, in the Word of God. John, you're right, son, but now let me tell you what's happened since then. And filled it. Now, what did Paulus do? He embraced it. Why? Because he was of the right spirit. So, now, that's all, now just an illustration to show you how you have progression. You have a progression in Revelation. You have a progression in the dispensations. The chronology is, helps us locate it. So, here we are now. We've got this going on. We've got, the, we've got the gospel of the grace of God being preached, and now they are assaulting the apostle Paul. Let's move past her, and let's move up to today. In the way, how many ever heard of the emerging church movement? All right. The emerging church, it's quite a, it's quite a, it's quite a thing. It's, hap, it's, it's, it's an issue that has to be dealt with. All right. All right. Now, the emerging church, here are some of the quotations from some of their leaders. <clears throat> One of their leaders says, The God who punished Jesus on the cross for man's sin, quote, is a God who is incapable of forgiving unless he kicks somebody else. Can you believe that they call themselves a Christian church and that a man will make a statement like that? Many of these contemporary Christian artists worship a rebel Christ. Uh, quote, Jesus Christ is the biggest rebel to ever walk the face of the earth. Unquote. The Bible says rebellion is the sin of what? They like a rock and roll party Jesus. Quote, he's always cool. He's got his thing together. He calls Jesus our Lord JC. Again, he says, jamming with a lamb. Another quote, God gave rock and roll to you. Put it in the soul of everyone. They talk about a party in heaven. The Lamb and I are drinking new wine. Jesus enjoys dancing with the angels and grooving to the sound of Christian rhythm and blues pumped out of a boombox. And on and on and on it goes. Here's what they say. 
They say that God, a God who would allow multitudes to go to eternal hell, is not great or mighty. He says that people who preach this are misguided and toxic. There's something wrong with this God and calls him terrifying and traumatizing and unbearable. He said if an earthly father acted like the God who sends people to hell, that we would contact Child Protection Services immediately. You ever do, son, and you'll be in trouble, I'll tell you that right now. Jesus is a supraculture. That's a big fancy word. Present within all cultures. Refuses to be co-opted or owned by any one culture. See what they've done? They've made it a cultural thing, Western European, all this stuff. He doesn't even state that those coming to the Father through him will even now know that they are coming exclusively through Him. There's only one mountain, but many paths. People come to Jesus in all sorts of ways. Sometimes people use His name. Other times they don't. Another name. This is real, folks. This is the kind of thing that's going on now. How do you get here? How do you get here? How do you get to the point to where they assault the Bible how do you get to that point to where the Bible is not the authority anymore? My feelings, my culture, whatever pop theology happens to be, happens to be coming down the pike today, that's my authority. It's mostly feel good because it's relativism. What's relativism? Relativism is a hideous idea that whatever feels good to you, you do it. If black is white to you, let black be white to you. If black is red to you, let black be red to you. If bad is good to you, let bad be good. Don't ever judge anybody else's ideas or thought or, pro or profession or doctrine. or Let everybody just get together. Why can't we just all get together and have a good time and feel good? So the churches are designed to make you feel good. They're feel good. Where's that leading? Oh, soul. That, where is it leading? Is it leading somewhere? If I can redefine the Lord Jesus Christ and remake Him, have I done something? Have I done a big deal? Could the Antichrist use that? Yes, sir. That's where it's leading. Well, preacher, we've got 30,000 in church. I don't know. I don't care. I really don't care. I want Temple Baptist Church to be what God wants it to be. Whether it's a thousand or a hundred or fifty. Really, folks, really. What matters in this world? The applause of men? Well, it's going to lead somewhere. And we're going to find out where. We're going to find out why and how and, and the, the springboard and why all this is going on. And why is it important to us? It's very important. I got a... Yes, sir. There in Hebrews 9. The book of Hebrews will help lay down the transition from law to grace. It does. It lays it down. The book of Hebrews does. Better than, probably better than any, any other book in the New Testament because it compares the two. Yes, sir. Yeah, you can look at it this way. A nation can be saved, but it doesn't mean that every individual in that nation is saved. See? 
because they're the sheep nations that'll go into the millennium. They'll be saved. But individual, when an individual is saved in this age of grace, they're born again. Amen. And that's also another issue that you have to deal with. Uh, we'll run out of time. I can just keep on and on and on. We'll run out. We'll pick it up again next week. We'll get it next week. Brother Lee, dismiss us, please.